Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church, Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. Let go of this microphone without talking about how wonderful she is. How, one, how she is one of the most effective partners that All Saints Church has ever had. How she's uh, one of my best friends. How she has my back, I have her back. And uh, we have all sorts of schemes going on about the future um, and in which we are going to continue the revolution. And both of us believe that um, you can join a revolution as long as you dance. Having said that, I'll pray. God dwells in you. Let us pray. We thank you, gracious God, for this occasion to surround ourselves with a fellowship of people who really do believe in justice and compassion, to a feast on this amazingly tasty food for the gifts of Terry Valentine, for the leadership of Michael Aran, and um, for the fact that your property is always to have compassion on everyone in a radically democratic way. We also uh, pray at this point for all of those young people who are in learning works as students, all of their potential, all of their promise, all of their goodness. So we receive their lives as gifts from you, as brothers and sisters of our heart. We pray your blessings on all of these many gifts. We pray that you consecrate us to your service and always keep us mindful and responsive and effectively responsive to those people who at this moment live without faith or community or food. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jackie Knowles. I'm co-chair of this event, and I want to say welcome to you all. It was kind of gloomy outside, but we're filled with sunshine, I see. Um, <clears throat> I, my co-chair is Abby McCarroll, and she is off to a high school reunion, but she just had to be part of this community and part of this event, and so I want to thank her also for, for her part. You'll notice that um, the title of this program is Compassion Works. That's what Michael Aran is all about, compassion and works, as in learning works and hope works. But before I introduce her, let me ask you, how many of you have heard about learning works before? Aha, uh -huh. so you're going to learn more about that today. All right, how many of you have heard about homeboys? Okay, I'll bet you don't know that learning works is the school for homeboys. Michaela is just like the Learning Works logo that's on the table, in the center of your table. She's connecting and reaching out to youth and families with hope and optimism. She's been here at All Saints before, as Ed has told you. She brought her Artworks Theater project here. She's negotiating with the Foster Care Project for a partnership, because what she likes to do is she likes to connect to all the services and the services that can reach more people, more youth, more effectively to get the youths out of crisis and into productive lives. And she's doing that very successfully. I've known her ever since her mother-in-law, my good friend Peg Ron, who's here, held a reception for her after she received her PhD from Berkeley in 1995. Well, she hit the ground running by establishing a consulting, educational consulting organization called Public Works and a tutoring center called Community Works. That then, when dropouts started showing up at the tutoring center, she opened a school for them, Learning Works. When her team of chasers, which is part of her successful model, encountered homeless youth on the streets of Pasadena, she opened a center for homeless youths. In addition to this, now, I, we have at the tables here members of her team, uh, her chasers and her administrators. So would you please stand so people can see who you are? <laughs> and
And so you can be asking, you can ask them questions afterwards. I hope maybe you have already gotten a little bit acquainted with them. But in addition to all that she does, she is also a wife and mother, not to mention, and her kids are here. So kids, would you please stand? And her husband, Kurt, please. Maddie, Maddie and Max. So as if this isn't enough, she's a Girl Scout leader for Maddie's troop. And I want you to know that she is so excited about what she's learned from her fellow scout leaders baking a cake in a box over a campfire. <laughs> so with that, Michael up. Wonderful introductions. I hope I don't cry in the first minute. I warn you, I'm a crier. Um, Thank you for being here. I'm going to start with sort of my journey, and I might, uh, Reverend, be doing some witness. Good. Amen. So, um, because this, as Max says, Mom, you should just call it the works because it's too many works. <laughs> so I want to back up for him. How did we get to all these works? Um, which was really in 2005, 2006, where it's easier to see it now, and I think then I had a spiritual crisis, so just one of those where God said, sorry, you're going left. You're not going to go right. We are going to go left. He, I, I really remember these conversations. I understand we created a research firm. I understand you have all those great degrees. Um, public works is doing well. The economy is doing well. We're studying all kinds of schools. And we were, um, at that point, studying high schools in L.A. Unified and San Bernardino and Orange County, where they have these lovely pyramid charts of who enters ninth grade and who gets to 12th grade. And we're talking about over 50% in many schools where they don't make it to that graduation stage. And it's, it's pretty disgusting. And so I'm studying this, and I'm looking, well, is that happening in Pasadena? And lo and behold, it was at 24.6%. Um, I was pretty shocked. Uh, so it, as, as this is going on, then uh, I, as God works in my life, dropouts started to show up to the tutoring center, community works. So I was, I was really serving at-risk youth, I was kids that with single parents or ones that were maybe not special ed, they were underdiagnosed, or kids that were just going through rough times and we were trying to get them to college. And boom, in comes kids I had never seen or knew about. Um, they were dropouts, and they were kids that I was like trying to get back into school. And we're talking about a group of about five, and he couldn't get them back in. And now it makes some sense to me because it's hard. I remember walking one student in in November, and he hadn't been to class since September. And we went class to class and said, "Will you take him back?" They don't know what to do with it. They can't. He's an F. Can you bring him back second semester? You're like, whoa, because they can't figure out what to do with the content the kid didn't get in that time period compared to other students. It wouldn't be equitable. So, so here I am now, a researcher with dropouts, trying to figure out how to get them graduated, arguing with the school district they had to do something. And they started a program actually in my space because I just was loud. And as and I call this my wilderness period because I really, in retrospect, did not know what I was doing. And it was a time in my life where we had kids sleeping on couches, we were tutoring all night, and I was praying a lot, and I was mad at God. It was like, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> and I, we argued a lot, and he kept winning, and it really stunk. And so I had to keep pressing on with this issue. And I remember, you're going to hear in my story a few few All Saints guidepost moments, interestingly, um, that I reflected on when I was thinking about what to say. And one of them I've told Reverend Bacon was a weekend where Sister Prejean was here, and I came to hear about the death penalty, because I just, just want it gone. And I come, and the weekend was about poverty. The weekend was about living with the poor. It was about being with those families. It was so powerful. And I went up to her after because I was pretty much understanding now that's what I was doing. And I said to her, I said, gosh, I just really appreciate it. And I feel so alone. And, I mean, people really thought I was crazy at this point. And she says to me, oh, darling, the choir is coming. The choir is coming. You're going to have all these dropouts. Spread the word. 
And you can fast forward and see the choir. So it, it is, and it's great. And so in the end, we ended up deciding to charter the school. Because it, it, any charter administrator will say to you, you know, what, what's different? You get to pick your staff. That's it. There's no other magic to it. I needed, I needed teachers who wanted to be with these kids that are fairly ugly, that they have challenges. I needed them to want to be on relationship first. I needed those relationships. You can teach anyone algebra if, they ha if you have a relationship with them. Um, I wanted them to not think of themselves as an authority figure. Teachers in our school, when you enter, they've been done so dirty by teachers and administrators that you, are, you have to see yourself as I need to build a relationship. So we ended up doing that and also coming up with this concept of a chaser. So the chasers, each teacher has a chaser. The chasers, here's one, um, chase kids down. They're, we thought we were going to be chasing them into school. It's really wonderful about when you do loving work, they find us. We chase them to stay in school. You commit on Tuesday, you fall apart by Thursday in real poverty. So we are on all those issues related to poverty and how do you keep in school so that the kids graduate. We also learned, and it's my most important piece of paper in the entire school, are our principles. I want to read a couple of them to you because I think it's really important. Um, we are a school that believes strongly in fresh starts, if you read this, about free of judgments and labels. We are a school that proclaims forgiveness and unconditional love. And we believe strongly if all other public schools would do that, we wouldn't have a need for learning works. But these are all the kids that have been pushed out and they have nowhere to be and no one is dragging them back off the couch after seven to eight months. So our school now um, is 400 strong. That includes our homeboy site. But an interesting story about that, I went on a transformational journey with Lorna Miller. And I had read in your newsletter, Homeboy Industries, didn't know anything about it. So the truth is my program at Homeboy sp sprung from that transformational journey that um, then Greg, at, Father Greg asked me, he saw the principles, I met Shan Lee on that journey, and he's like, wait, you gotta be here, we, we need help, we gotta have a school. So we have been the school at Homeboy Industries for the last two and a half years. Um, we're entering our third, and we started in Chinatown, and now we're, we, we decided jointly to move back to the original Homeboy site on First Street in Boyle Heights. We're literally in Greg's old office. So it's there with 90 strong, and that is in territory, gang territory, and we do it a little different there. It's scary, and, these, and it's real poverty. They don't have anything. Um, and so I've ended up being a school for dropouts that are, pre we have a pregnant teen program because they come in many forms. We have probation youth, we have lots of drug issues, we have foster care, and that it is absolutely, absolutely lovely. Um, in that, it is lovely, come by any time. And, and in that time period, another thing happened out of the homeboy transformational journey, which was um, Reverend Bacon got excited about connecting adults to our youth, and he helped start a theater camp where the kids would come from Learning Works here, and the professionals in your congregation would teach them these skills, and they would kind of live here for a week. And that happened, and I saw that the kids liked art. Turns out most dropouts are kinesthetic or hands-on learners, right? They're the ones that don't make it in the school. And so I then started to pray about art. I just, I, I, God answers prayer. You sometimes don't like the answer, but he answers it. So I drove around my neighborhood, drove up to a building that looked like a perfect art space to do it. This was in the middle of the theater camp thing. And walked in, didn't know who owned it. Turned out Victoria Resnick owned it. And she goes, um, I said, I really want to rent this space. It's so great. And she said, oh, I'll do better than that. I'll upgrade it for $30,000 and give it to it a dollar a month. And born was Artworks. And so you have that. Artworks is now a community um, art program. In the daytime, it's for Learning Works Charter School. In the afternoons, any middle or high school or anywhere can come for free and do silk screening, recording studio. Kwame is the coordinator of Artworks, and he's sitting over there. So we are going to get your youth group over there and all that. But it is a really fabulous place to be. And it emerged from prayer and, I think, all saints. Um, and so that is the, the next artwork. So then I just kind of keep going because 
Because you can. Because you can. So I got a counseling grant with Lisa Kirstein, our social worker, director of student support, and we were just one of the populations we just don't know what to do with is youth homelessness. So foster care is good. It's a capture system. A good is strong, but let's go with that. It is a system, once they're in, then they have a label we can kind of work with. But if you are poor, you have been surfing couches, as we call it, a um, couple park stays here and there, you're not picked up by the system in any way in those older ages. And even if you are homeless at 17, no one's going to do anything about it. Uh, you're aging out of the system. Um, the other thing we learned in our journey on homelessness is that if um, you are an emancipated youth, and there's more services for transitional living, but if you are an emancipated youth from the system, the foster care, but you are an illegal immigrant, meaning you never got your papers, you can now go to community college, but you have no access to ha all the housing resources. So we have a lot of um, undocumented uh, youth out there in the emancipation system that we can't capture. So we end up with about 28 at Learning Works alone homeless youth um, that we try to figure out. So we decided to go and figure out how others are dealing with this problem. So Jackie, Reverend Paige Eves from uh, Crescenta Valley, Lisa, Monica, my chaser who's amazing, uh, we went on these journeys and we tried to say, well, how could someone take this on? I'm always looking for someone else to take it on. I think I'm a starter and then spins off. So, so when we went on the journey, um, we saw that you, my friend's place is amazing over in Hollywood, and I walked in and I just immediately started crying. It was like finding your own, you know, like your kindred spirit. And theirs is a great model, because you walk in and they treat you like uh, you are uh, completely housed in middle class, let's just say. It is beautiful, the compassion and the kindness, and they get the number one thing they need is clean underwear, clean socks, here's your toiletries, have a microwave dinner. And so I started to see that we could do this. You know, why not? I mean, why couldn't we do a drop-in center where I still have to have them go sleep on the park or surf a couch, but they're at least getting a dinner. They're at least getting the dignity of clean underwear. Um, we have a shower. Why don't we just hook it up? Okay. And then someone came forward with washers and dryers. Great. So we're launching really this month this concept of in the afternoons, 4 to 7. They can come anytime because Learning Works is always open. But 4 to 7, that this is the time if you don't have a place to lay your head and you want to eat and you want to get to your toiletries and you want to wash your clothes and you want to um, maybe take a shower, that come on by. And so that sprung the term Hope Works. Um, again, too many works. But uh, which then, I forgot Jackie went to this church. This is the hilarious part of the All Saints Connection web. She's like, well, we're doing, we're going to do a luncheon. I'm like, oh, right, you're an All Saints gal. That's my place. Let's go. <laughs> and so that is how we got from, uh, from Learning Works to Hope Works. Now, in our visits, we saw, first of all, youth kind of is 17 to 25, okay? If you don't find them some secure living, um, this is my anecdotal guess, I think Lisa and I are on the same page on this, within, like, say, by the time they're 21, they will be homeless. They lose their habits. They get used to the freedoms, and it's a trade-off. Um, it, they're hard to employ after that. So that 17 to 21 is just crucial for graduation, jobs, and housing. In the other programs we visited, we eventually, my, of course my eventual, is we saw that you can do a residential with runaway money and others um, funding where it's, it's basically one night to 40 days. And we believe, because we've had to do it before, you can find a youth housing in one day to 40 days. You start asking about relatives, you try to figure out what couch you can buy, right? Well, what if we threw $100 and pretty soon you can find them housing? But I need a place to keep these kids one night to 40 days. So my prayer is eventually someone will take on helping with the residential component of this. 
But I figure we start with what we can do and do the best we can now because we can. We can open that up and we can get toiletries and we can do this and it's not expensive. We can make this happen. So that is where HopeWorks came from. So I, I wanted to sort of close on maybe just reflectively, this is my, the witness part. I didn't even get into our Ohio Children's Defense Fund, we're going to end mass incarceration, right? That's all coming too. But we're not there yet. I, there's no works attached to that. How do we do that? <laughs> mass incarceration does not work. Um, <laughs> dud. Anyway, so uh, I've said it before, because um, people do say, well, why, why doesn't she stop, you know? Which I always think is so interesting. Do you ever sleep? Do you ever... Well, obviously, I'm living a calling um, that I, I didn't predict. Uh, and I'm listening a lot more now about where that's supposed to go. And I've learned, because I was such a planner, that God, God isn't really um, into planners. <laughs> you have to listen and know the next step. And then what's tomorrow? And what's the next day? And so you sort of march that way. But when I was reflecting on how did I become that way, um, I remembered um, something really, really important. When Max was born, and I was a breadwinner and had to get on these airplanes from my six-month baby to, uh, you know, pack your bag and get on a plane and go. And I remember the ache, like this just leaving Max, first child, just that mommy ache. And I remember telling myself this. When were you born, by the way? 95? So this is 95. So I remember telling myself, stop. Stop. Head and heart are really creative. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. You got to do it. Get on the plane. So you do this, stop. And you can do it. You can do it on all kinds of stuff, right? You know, like, I shouldn't eat that chocolate cake. Stop. Take the chocolate cake. Right? <laughs> Take it. You can just do it. I mean, watch. It, you know, I, you just tell yourself not to think about it. Like trying to um, think about racism and really going there. Who wants to really go there? Pain. Pain, right? So you teach yourself to stop feeling or getting into someone else's shoes. And I think what happened to me is I couldn't block it anymore. I think what happened was I, God was throwing at me after 2006 so many of those moments where I'm sitting in court with a mom whose son is going off for 16 years. Well, you just go there. You just cry with her. Um, I remember eating dinner with our family, and it was a lovely dinner, and getting a text, I'm hungry, I need a Big Mac. Well, you go there. You stand up and get the damn Big Mac. So what happened is, over time, I think I was beaten down, and the voices just got too loud, and then Father Greg's words came in, which is kinship. We are here to be with people. We are here to be with the poor. We're not here to fix it, necessarily. We're here to live with each other and hear those stories, and in that, there's compassion and hopefully motivation to just love. So for me, I'm grateful to be here, and I challenge you to hear the voices of my kids. Boy, talk about having tears in your eyes. Just the concept that we're here to be with one another. Rich, poor, whatever. Michael, I just thank you so very, very much. Now, of course, we'd like to open this up for questions. So, Michael, come on back up here so you can answer all the questions. So, do we... Let's, I somebody hope together. Can do this. Okay. Any questions? Yes. What was that? Tutors, we love tutors, and we need tutors all the time. You can come for an hour. 
So we would love it. And my number's on everything, and my cell number is how I answer all my calls. So um, please, tutors, one hour to come live with us. Yes, Madeline Ron? <laughs> Did you want to say something? What? Huh? Oh, you want a burger works? Good question. <laughs> it's coming! <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're having, thank you. The drop in, we have a drop in open house that actually Reverend Bacon will be signing his books at on Thursday at Learning Works. Please feel free to come by. That's a, an easy way to come over there. And that is from, I think we're doing two, Chasers are doing tours five to six, and it's open till eight. So come on over. That'll be fun. That's where it is. 90 North Daisy. Remember, the other God blessing that happened is public works ended up in non territory. So when I say I'm doing a safe haven, and we went to then transition to a school, um, it was a lot easier. It's a lot easier to do it in that zone where we get everybody on board with the principals, and then we have a safe haven there. So it's, it's, a, it's a great location for this kind of work. Yes? Do you want to describe, Gary? Yeah, come on. Will one of the chasers describe what they do? Hi, how you doing? Um, what I do is uh, basically build a relationship with the children, get to know them better, get to know their parents, their community, where they hang out at, and just become a friend, you know, just a mentor to keep them steady on the right path of doing their work and just uh, being able to come to class every day. Um, Non-voluntary. <laughs> Gary's great. Who would cross him, right? Yeah. <laughs> and Monica, I mean, she's wonderful. And Kwame's now working with the Rosemary Girls. Stand with me, sweetie. Well, that's, I'm the first chaser. So the way it started when I was in my wilderness is I started to develop chaser. So I was literally chasing this first group around and saying, wait a minute, where are you? Get to school. What? Huh? Huh? And so you end up being sort of a surrogate parent, so to speak. So you're a mentor, a tutor, a... You know, we are, people will say, well, how do you engage the parents? Well, we, tr we, we often don't because it's so risky. Um, we are dealing with crisis kids. We're not dealing with that risk anymore. These are your gun-carrying, baby-carrying, drug-carrying kids. So, um, so Gary, these people all came from relationships with the first group of kids I was chasing. And so we have 12 chasers you were Dominic's friend, right? And, and, and so um, 12 chasers in the group at this point, and each teacher has a chaser. And I want to point out we do everything within the model of the school budget. So I'm trying to create a model that says others can do this. Um, in fact, we created this year a training guide for regular schools to do advocacy or chasing yourselves. I mean, we don't really want to have a learning works, but we're, we're glad it's here for now, but we gotta fix the schools. So, um, the chasers work full time, they're on 24 seven, if I have an emergency in the middle of the night, they have to go. Um, they know their load, they know who's on it, and uh, it's a fun group. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Yes. Do, do you partner with, with Pasadena Unified School District in some, in some way? Well, we're, we're chartered by them. We're in renewal year this year. So All Saints will hopefully be writing a letter of support. Um, so we have to get renewed every five years. We've just ended our fifth year as a school. Uh, the, politically, they love, you know, Renat is great. She's the board president. She's here. We went to Ohio together. They, they, they get a couple benefits out of having the learning works. One is... Um, the dropout rate has decreased from 24.6% to 15%. So they get credit for us grabbing those kids, and then they're in our statistics. So once they kind of caught on to that, that was a, that was a win. Um, and then the other thing is if a kid gets expelled from a school within Pasadena, we take them. We love our expulsions. 
Okay, you threw a chair at the teacher. That's a dud. So, how, you know, recovery. So those are the ones we get to recover. Expulsions are a lot less risky, though, than uh, kids on probation or more in the de delinquency system. I mean, they're scary to educators. I get it. You don't want a chair thrown at you. But there's, we need to recover. We can't, we can't stop. Um, we have a mi middle school that has, is all really expelled, kicked out kids. It runs about 15 to 20 a year. But you'll get the gun cases, the drug selling, the chair throwing in that group. Yes. And I wondered if it's Homegirl Cafe cooking. Because I thought the, the lunch food. Oh, was no, awesome. this was someone else. Who cooked? Terry's here. Terry's here. There. Well, Terry cooked. Anyway, that's a good resource, also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Homegirls is catering at the event Thursday, though, if you want to come have some Homegirls. Um, the child that threw the chair and hit the teacher and he comes to your school, do you have that same kind of problem or how do you deal it with depends. it? It um, depends. So my answer usually on this stuff, because I mean, we've been in a few, um, I mean, it, it depends. So is it hard? The principles are what rule our school. And the, for, when, they, when a student first arrives, they don't believe it. So they don't believe they're going to be forgiven. They don't believe there's going to be a fresh start because they've never experienced that in their life anywhere else. And we mean it. So even when someone does something wrong in our school, um, we, we take a time out to, this is another thing I've learned over time, uh, forgiveness means you understand your actions and you're asking for forgiveness. Sometimes that takes a couple days. But do they always come back around? Absolutely. Now, girls are harder than boys. That's what we, right? Last year, did we have a girl group? Woo! Um, and they don't forgive as fast, is what I've learned. Women, I don't want, I want to say it's only girls, but women, I don't know. There's something in this. So they hold lot, grudges longer. The boys, they have a challenge. They shake it off. They, my bad. It, <laughs> you know, but I mean, it could have been something with blood, and it's gone. Um, not the girls. I mean, it doesn't help just to, you know, we have pregnancy issues, we have guy issues, it's just, it's a nightmare. But, but we love them, and I love works. Oh, love works, I could do something with that. Uh, <laughs> love. We, we just love them to death, and the truth is, if you love someone to death, and you really mean that, like, I love you, I, you're, something's going to move. Something's going to move, I promise you. Um, just try it someday on your neighbor or somebody who's annoying. Just love them. Pray on them. And you, you know what? Something moves. It's crazy. The other thing I should point out with Learning Works, um, I believe as a country we are very age discriminatory. So I, when I say to you at my 44 years old, when I look in the eyes of a 17-year-old, I am no better than that 17-year-old. I don't know more than them. I know different. So in kinship, there is no authority. Kinship is being with someone. So if you approach youth that way, they just can feel it. And you, we've got a wonderful staff doing that every day. So it's a different kind of place. I have a question. Uh, what is the mental health component? And do you do things like teach uh, conflict resolution? and uh, budgeting for the future and things like that? So I've thought about this. The, so the first thing is, remember, they're coming in like an entire year of credits behind, at least. Okay? We're not talking about someone who needs to make up three classes. These are dropouts. And so the first and ultimate goal is, of course, academic credits, high school diploma, and the chasers, that's their job. They're not many social workers. They're not psychologists. They're, sorry, you're graduating. Let's get it done. That said, um, the, Lisa is a licensed social worker, and ha, we, have had to end, we have ended up deciding we can't use traditional mental health that often. 
It's a whole way. I have this little theory that's happened. Is I think we went from anthropological research on humans to this psychological social work, and somewhere the missionary work and the social work never met because the social work model is I'm going to fix you. I am better than you. I'm going to decide what to do next with you. That doesn't work. Not in poverty. I mean, I don't think anywhere. But. We aren't like that, so we do do all the required probation. Um, so if you're on probation, you go to our required anger management uh, therapy. If you do something, let's say in the school that was, um, well, you would have probably been expelled in another school. But and we decide, no, no, you need some anger management. Then we require that when you come back. So we're we're doing all of that in our setting. Lisa has a couple social work interns that we have there. Um, they need a lot of work, but we are on high school diploma. Meaning, I can't. That was the other thing I anchored with God in my journey. I was on. Oh my God, am I on? No, I'm on high school diploma, and I'm going to find partners to help me do the other stuff. Yes. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Two questions. First, can your kids age out of your school? Are there restrictions? Mm -hmm. And second of all, what do your numbers tell you? What are they moving on to after they graduate? Those are great questions. So a charter school can serve till 21. If the kid is close, then we will keep them and not receive funding. Um, I have learned you're much, we have much more power with 17, 18, and 19 year olds. As you can try to, one of the things we're working on first is time management. If you have been on a couch, stoned, I'm being, not, I'm being honest, for seven months and no one has put any pressure on you to get off the damn couch, how, in our program, because we are independent study, but we don't tell them that, they have a bunch of experiences they have to do, but we're wooing you back one hour at a time to get you to, kid you not, in May, Kids are there 40, 50 hours on the school site trying to graduate. It's nuts. But what we're trying to do with a dropout is get those time management uh, skills back. No, you have to be on time, which is impossible, but they get there. Um, so we can keep them. And then what I believe, we, we did our three-year follow-up study of our graduating classes. I think it's too early, but there were a couple things that came out of it. One, they were going to post-secondary more than I had expected. They were, it was over 60%. And over 50% were employed, so that was good, too. The thing where, it, it was great. It's great. It's, and the thing that we're good at is 30% of our kids are on probation. Only 2% were incarcerated. See, I'm ending mass incarceration, do you see? So 2% were incarcerated, and that's unbelievable. So what the researchers that I've gone to to ask have told me that the number one thing I'm doing is decreasing incarceration. We're not great at second-time births. I don't know. We can't get those ladies to stop having babies. But that's something we're working on with Planned Parenthood, and we've got some... Creativity, but Lord have mercy. It just is such an economic loser to have multiple children without any education at some point. You know, you really, um, it hurts you. So does that answer the question? So we, we wish there was more career vocational education in this state. We wish, and I say this, I would say this, I wish we didn't live, PCC is a good four-year school. We have not really a good transitional post-secondary program for our kids. Adult ed doesn't exist anymore here, so it's challenging. Huh? Oh, you know, maybe you said, first of all, what an incredible, incredible, incredible oh, piece of work you've taken on. Um, these are the hardest, hardest students to, you know, work with. Um, so many of the other charter schools, you know, they, they push students out too. Yeah. So I mean, to have a place where, so just kudos to you. Um, what is the graduation rate? I mean, it sounds like oh, I, sh I haven't everybody. even talked about it. So we're we're on a roll. We're doing good. So we graduate a third of our school every year. Last graduation was 107. Do I have that right? I mean, we we got that down. I mean, I. alternative ed program in the state and we're we're winning um, so but that said the right question is where are we that's why I keep getting, coming back to different works which is you know where are we on transitional services and where are we as a community with these kids after they graduate um, I always thank God I don't have father Greg's um, calling because who wants to employ felons as a calling Lord we can't you know what I'm saying like I can graduate people I can feel some success uh, we have come nowhere on hiring felons. 
So it's a dud. Police and probation really didn't like us at first. And now they really partner with us. So probation at first, because you really, when you come to Learning Works, you have to say, okay, wait a minute, the, the dropout's the customer, okay? I mean, you really have to say, no, I don't agree with the conditions. I'm working with this population. I am in kinship. So what happens in the traditional systems is they just think at first you're enabling. And I keep thinking, do you know how much I enable, Max? You know, what I'm saying is, like, these are kids without parents. They are not doing the scaffolding to adulthood, right? And so I don't see it as that. I see it as, as we are helping scaffold them to the next stage. So probation finally got it. They, they, we have some key probation officers where it's like nothing else works anyway. We might as well try learning works. And that's how it started. And then we'd have success stories, and it'd be okay. Um, the, the other thing, I think, with the Pasadena police, we'll see how this goes, though. At first, they would just keep pulling us over. I had to create our own van route because they were arresting our students of color at the bus stops trying to come to school. So I ended up creating my own van route with my own driver. Sorry. And so then we got to know each other a little bit better. Chief Sanchez loves Father Greg. We've got, you know, so it's come a while. I think it's the, it's the initial cops who are first year to four years that are learning some. They're inexperienced. They're frightened, even though they can't admit it. And they are learning a few bad tricks. It's always trying to get them on board. That is always. But they know I'll just pick up that damn phone and call the watch commander. And it will, you know, and so they get sick of me. And then they have to like me. Right? <laughs> I mean, keep your enemies close. It all works. It's good. So anyway, the sheriffs are harder. So Altadena sheriffs, because the staff changes so much. I don't know if you know the way or sheriffs organize, but and I'm a c completely do not like the way the sheriffs are organized. If they're overwhelmed in Altadena, they can call in any other sheriffs. Well, sheriffs countywide. So sometimes when the stuff gets rough up in Altadena, well, the Compton cops showed. You know, they call in from other regions and they don't know our community. And so, and then when you go to file a complaint with the sheriff, unlike here in your local police, the only person you can file a complaint with is Baca. Makes no sense. How is he going to handle? every county complaint on sheriffs. So it's a little more challenging. Yes. Uh, I, I, I would just like to know what, why the police are arresting people at, at the bus stop, uh, you know, when they're just standing there trying to catch the bus. The other thing I'm wondering is how do you deal with kids that are on drugs like uh, methamphetamines and things like that. Do you? Ha do you we have all that fun stuff. Um, the the first thing is I, it, 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 this is where we're, we I know All Saints is going to go there with mass incarceration. I'm right. And so when someone says to me, "Why are they stopping people at the bus stop?" It means to me we need to do a better job educating people on where we are with race, where we are with incarceration, where we are on profiling. A black man is has so many strikes against him at 17 years old, it's nuts. So if you live in northwest Pasadena and you're black, you got, you're going you're gonna to have some challenges, do you think, my, my friends? So you just get harassed. Harassed. Um, and I don't... It just is. And we need to not... This is one of those, we've got to go there. We've got to really understand that this is happening and that your chances of being incarcerated as a black man are ginormous. So that said, and um, it's definitely more African American than Latino, although it depends on the area. I mean, it, it's still, even in the statistics, it's more African American. So, and then on the drugs. We, we work on the drug issue. We, we end up, if, if we end up with a meth case or something more serious, Lisa is just working that case, trying to figure out what to do. Um, mostly the issue is related to pot and um, marijuana. I mean, it's, and it's not a very motivating drug. So we, <laughs> so we tutor people stoned. Think about that for a minute. If I outlawed everyone who came here that I'm suspicious, right? Not to mention it's in your clothes. Again, poverty it could be in their clothes. It could, could maybe it didn't happen today. Maybe it was another day. So the truth is, I, I just look at kids and say, now, could you move your habit? 
incremental. After five o'clock, dude, these are the conversations I'm having with people. It's crazy, right? But it works. It works. And so move your habits. Move your habits. That's what you'll hear us all say that. But if they come, it's like, well, I'm not going to not let you do math because you're stoned. That just rewards the behavior. It's going to be really painful to do algebra for an hour stoned. I sucks to be you. Let's go. Oh, one more and then we're done. One more and then we're done. Okay, one more. Thank you. You know, with this, these big changes in our economic status, my worry in my particular backyard is that our youth are looking for pocket money. Uh, their parents are stressed. The people are losing their jobs. Parents are being deported. What kind of changes over the last few years, a before and after scenario, your graduation rate has gone up? Your numbers have gone up? What do you see has changed in the last two years since this significant crisis that our society is in? I've always worked with kids that are hungry. So I can't say I can, meaning like, at, one of our biggest things is just they come starved. Can you imagine like making it till four o'clock to eat a dollar burger? Like, but this, this is what they know how to do. So I'm not sure, I, I would say theft is up for sure. I think we have basis of that with the recession. And um, we definitely see that in some of our charges we have to deal with. But overall, I, I, I think that poverty, how do I put this? The recession has hit the middle group more than, the poverty's always, always been there in my opinion. In our town, it's been there. We've been ignoring it. So, so it's not like there's this new poverty. The poverty was there five years ago when you know, I started this. So, but I think the, the part that gets crazy when you think about theft and all that, it, it is, you know, it's, it starts, brings up fears and then, you know, and I just don't go there anymore. Like, I, I just, I want, I want the economy to get better for everybody. And I want us to acknowledge there is a very poor population that is, does not have equal access to education, jobs, and livelihood. And that's just the truth. And you do what you can to be a part of that solution. Because everybody has a different calling. God is speaking to us our own way. And mostly we usually, you know, it's like calm yourself to hear it and something will come. Well, thank you so very much.